I have been in the forefront of the fight against the traditional enemies of free speech. I found myself in the forefront. I never picked this particular battle. It's a foolish battle to pick. If all you want to do is write, if all you want to do is turn out books, and you've only got a limited number of days and nights and weeks and months and years left in your lifespan, you don't want to have to fight this kind of battle where you have to set three years aside to go into the law courts and do all the sterile kind of thinking and paperwork and argumentation, which has nothing to do with the writing of history. You don't want to have to do that. It's a terrible burden on the brain and on your time and on your physical resources and on your financial resources. Fortunately, I was able to continue the fight by virtue of two resources. My first resource was the internet. When the battle began in earnest at the beginning of last year, and it was a three-month battle in the law courts, I had to attend court every day for three months, in person, alone, while the other side turned up with 40 barristers and lawyers and associates and historians and their assistants and students, row upon row of them, linked by their computers and their laptops, I had my own computer and I was linked to all the other historians in the world, all the non-conformist historians, the ones who were interested that history should come out and the truth should be told in that courtroom. And every day when there had been some particularly serious point raised that I wanted to be able to put to the opposing witnesses in cross-examination the next day, I would go back to my apartment at five o'clock in the evening and I would sleep for two hours on the sofa. And after I got up at seven in the evening, I'd go to the computer and I would tap in a message to my gang, as I called them, of assistants around the world, Australia, Vancouver and elsewhere. And I'd say, we have a problem with the doors of the crematorium too. Problem is that it's been pointed out to the court by their expert Van Pelt that the doors have been changed from the inside of the mortuary to the outside. These gas-tight doors with a peephole are now going to be on the outside. And the defendants are arguing that the reason that that change has been made in the blueprints is that the bodies of the thousands of victims inside are going to be pressing against the doors and they can't open the doors inwards. So they've got to open the doors outwards like these doors here. What can you say about that? And overnight, around the world, these experts of mine would start thinking and burrowing and looking in the records, and then back would come a message from an architect in New York, one of the most senior and qualified architects, I can't mention his name for obvious reasons, who sent to me by email an image of a page from the German architect's manual, which was actually in use at Auschwitz at that time, a manual called Neufert, which Van Pelt had admitted was used by the SS construction architects building that camp. And on the page of that manual for the construction of air raid shelters, it says these gas-tight doors with peepholes are to be installed on the outside of the door frame. Door has to open outwards. In other words, they were converting this building in readiness for later use, possibly as a gas-tight air raid shelter. Nothing to do with bodies, pressing against the inside of the door. And by 7 a.m., when I came back from taking little Jessica to school, the messages were there, waiting for me in the email. And I opened them up, and I printed them out, and took them down to the courthouse at 9 a.m., and the people on the other side were baffled. How was I getting this information just like that? And that was one of my resources, the Internet. The other resource was my worldwide circle of supporters, the Fighting Fund. All this time that I was fighting that legal action, I had no income whatsoever. Deborah Lipstadt, my main opponent in this action, had seen to that. She and her cohorts had put pressure on all my publishers around the world. You don't spot it at the time. I knew that they'd put pressure on St. Martin's Press, who were going to publish the Goebbels biography in 1996, because she told the Washington Post that she had done that, that she and her friends at the Anti-Defamation League had put pressure on the St. Martin's Press, one of the biggest publishers in New York, to cancel the contract that they had with me for publishing that book. I knew that she had done that. It wasn't until the next year or two that, looking back, you could see that other things had happened that you hadn't associated at that time with the campaign. Paperback publishers had suddenly ceased responding. A printer in Sweden had suddenly refused to print a book. A printer in Denmark had come under trade union pressure, and so it was around the world. It was a global campaign to interdite my ability to find and research and publish and print what I had found. It's made it a very interesting battle indeed, but it made it also a painful battle because I had the school bills, the grocery bills, the rent, telephone bills, all the rest of it to pay, which increased exponentially because of the legal battle I was now facing. I couldn't afford the lawyers, I couldn't afford the counsel because you're looking there at two or three, four hundred thousand dollars, even for a short action, and let alone one that lasted three months. My opponents in this action spent six million pounds, around about eight million dollars, defending the action that I brought. I brought the action against Deborah Lipstadt in that same year, 1996. I thought the time has now come when you've got the fight back. My opening speech to the court, in fact, in January last year, I began by describing how when I wrote my very first book in 1963, it was published by William Kimber, he had advised me, never ever take libel action. If people smear you, ignore it. 
And the reason he said that is because at that time, when I first visited him in his office in the West End of London, this publisher, William Kimber, whose obituary I later wrote for the Daily Telegraph, he was involved in a libel action over a book by a man called Leon Uris. Leon Uris had written a book called Exodus, and in that he had accidentally libeled a doctor who had served in Auschwitz, Dr. Daring. If you read the book by Leon Uris, Exodus, you'll see that there's a Dr. Daring who is described as having performed thousands of experiments on women without anesthetic in the camp. And the unfortunate thing for Uris in his novel was that there was a Dr. Daring who had been in Auschwitz, and he was living not in Poland, but in the West End of London, in Ealing. And this Dr. Daring was understandably extremely indignant, and he sued for libel, and he won one hapenny, the smallest coin of the realm worth less than one cent, which is the way that an English jury says, OK, you're right, but we don't want you to make any money out of it. And Kimber had to fight that action for three years, the same as I had to fight the Lipset action. And for three years, his life was made hell by the demands of the opposing lawyers. And his advice to me was never, ever get involved in a libel action. And I followed that advice for 30 years. And the problem then is if you have a 30-year writing career and the press gets to know that you don't defend yourself, they think it's open season. And by 1996, I could see, as I stood at the bottom of this valley, a mudslide thundering down the slopes towards me and threatening to engulf me. And the only way to stop that mudslide was to start frantically hammering pegs into the countryside, which I did with these writs. I issued a writ against Deborah Lipstadt for the book that she wrote attacking me called Denying the Holocaust. A week or two later, I issued a writ against the Guardian newspaper and an author, Gitta Sereni, for an article that she wrote in April 1996 in which she accused me of stealing from the Moscow archives the glass plates with the Goebbels diaries. She accused me of cheating a colleague, a historian, out of the credit for finding the diaries. She said a number of other things that were totally untrue. And as for the Guardian newspapers who had published that article, they had waged a war against me for 25 years. Some of you have asked me about this caricature of me, which I have turned into my own personal logo. It appeared as a caricature in the Guardian newspaper in England in 1977, which is 24 years ago. So that's visible proof of the campaign they've conducted. It was originally part of a larger cartoon that they'd published when my book, Hitler's War, was first published. And the cartoon showed David Irving sitting at his desk in his office in London with a bust of Adolf Hitler on the desk. Only the bust of Adolf Hitler looks surprising like Mr. Irving, or is it the other way around? But anyway, this is the caricature which they published. And I bought the caricature from the cartoonist. I paid him a handsome sum for it because it was so well done. It was quite funny. And I've used it ever since. And since then, The Guardian has continued a vicious campaign of attack against me. Nothing that I write is good. Everything that I write is bad, mendacious, distorted, lying, fallacious, deliberately following a political agenda. All the accusations that were made against me by Deborah Lipstadt. And now they're surprised and pained to find themselves at the receiving end of a libel since 1996. And they're hoping that I'll go away. And to their horror, I'm not going away because I've just issued fresh steps in that particular action. And we're going to go through the whole hell again next year or the year after because I don't like down. In Australia, I was tactless enough to call myself a four-flush shit. You know, the kind that you flush and you flush and you flush and it just doesn't go away. And that's me. They cannot destroy me. At the end of the Lipstadt action last year, which ended with a humiliating defeat for me, as you know, and I'm quite happy to say humiliating defeat because we know who inflicted the defeat. It was the same Judge Gray, Sir Charles Gray, who had acted on behalf of the British war criminal Lord Aldington, the man who sent tens of thousands of innocent Cossacks, Russians and Yugoslav back to their deaths in the hands of Stalin's and Tito's murderers. Lord Aldington, the British Army General, knew what he was doing, but claimed that he didn't. When Count Tolstoy published the whole facts in two books, Aldington sued for libel, and Sir Charles Grey represented this British war criminal and mass murderer. So he was always on the right side, on the establishment side, and there's not much you can do about it. When a judge is appointed for a case, you just have to grin and bear it. And he sat there with an impassioned face for three months before issuing this humiliating judgment, in which on the one hand he says, David Irving is undoubtedly one of the world's greatest experts on World War II which is a line I've quoted on the jacket of the Churchill book. And on the other hand, he says, well, on the other hand, he is uh, mendacious, fallacious, completely mistranslates documents, has a political agenda to follow whitewashing Hitler and all the rest of it. He says, David Irving undoubtedly has reasons and with great justification, he can criticize the Jews who've tried to destroy his life and career. And this cannot be called anti-Semitism. But David Irving is undoubtedly a vicious and devious anti-Semite. He says, that without question, David Irving isn't obsessed with racism. He couldn't say that because, of course, I've employed any number of 
with members of the ethnic minorities in my staff. But then on the next page of adjustment, he says Irving is a vicious racist. It's a strange kind of judgment. It's rather like a foreign office document, which would always have one paragraph giving one viewpoint, and then the next paragraph would say, but on the other hand. And that's how he wrote his judgment. It's as though there were two judge grades, one of whom who saw the truth and recognized that I was right, and the other of whom saw the writing on the wall and knew that if he found it in my favor, then he would be smeared for the rest of his young career as a judge, because he'd only just become a judge, and that he would never be left in peace. We had one or two judges like that in England, who were always the target of attack by the press. The name of uh, Justice Milford Stevenson comes to mind. Always the target of vicious attack by the press, sometimes principled, most often unprincipled. And he didn't want to go that way. The writing was on the wall during the whole of the Lipstadt trial because every day after two or three days, the press was subjecting me as the complainant in this case to a vicious attack in editorial columns and in the news columns and in opinion columns, in the letter columns. Every possible document and article and report was filed to make me look like a devious, vicious and unprincipled writer. On one occasion, as I said earlier, there was a whole page article in the Guardian newspaper attacking me with a huge photograph of me and the headline, The Bogeyman of the Nursery. Halfway through this trial, I repeatedly appealed to Judge Gray. I said, this is contempt of court, what these newspapers are doing. And he said, it would normally be contempt of court if this was a jury action, but I'm sitting here without a jury and I can ignore these newspaper reports. Well, he can say that, but of course he can't ignore the newspaper reports. The newspapers were uttering a warning to him of what would happen if he found in my favor. The courtroom was awash with money and hatred, and it was all over the other side of the courtroom. And I was standing alone on my side of the courtroom, fighting this one battle, fighting a proud battle because I knew I was right. And I knew we were making point after point after point. People were going home in the evenings. They were meeting me in the corridors outside saying, good Lord, I never knew that. And even in his own judgment, Judge Gray is forced to say when he comes to the question of Auschwitz and the reason, the strange paradox that on the one hand, you've got any number of documents that document and authenticate the shootings on the Eastern Front by the gangsters like that SS General I was talking about, SS General Yekon. And on the other hand, you haven't got a single document that authenticates Auschwitz as a killing center or extermination camp. Not a single document that shows that that building crematorium too in Auschwitz was a purpose-built death chamber. And in his judgment, Judge Gray said, well, I have to admit that I, like most people in this country, I suppose, had always thought that there was any number of documents in that direction that supported that view. And I was rather surprised, he says, that the evidence given to me by the defense was that there were no such documents, as Mr. Irving said. However, the eyewitnesses all confirm and bear out that this building was a purpose-built gas chamber. He said, Mr. Irving says that the holes in the roof through which the cyclone was poured do not exist. As the defense's own witness, Van Pelt, had testified in his own report, he admitted the holes aren't there. But the judge then went on to say, however, the five eyewitnesses confirmed that the holes were there, and therefore they were. He disregarded the literally concrete evidence of the roof, which is still there, and preferred to believe the eyewitness evidence of five witnesses who weren't produced in court for me to cross-examine and to test the validity of their expertise or what they had actually claimed to see. I could have run rings around those eyewitnesses had they come into that courtroom. One in particular, Ada Bimco, who said, I was taken into one of the gas chambers by a friend who was an SS officer. Oh, yes. <laughs> Ada Bimco, whose name now is Hannah Rosenzaft, and she's a member of the governing body of the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington. She said, I was taken in there by a friend who was an SS officer, and he showed me the giant cylinders containing the gas. Hello. The gas, allegedly, in the authenticated Wiesenthal Center version, came in tins, and the tins of pellets were tipped in through the holes in the roof. So what's all this about the giant cylinders of gas and pipes that she describes in her eyewitness testimony, as a result of which several men were hanged by the British in Hamburg after the war? The two officials of the company that made these cyclone pellets, which were pesticide pellets, they were hanged by the British for this, on her evidence. She wasn't produced in that courtroom. She wasn't cross-examined. Just a statement by her, sworn on oath, was produced. That was the way these war crimes trials were conducted. The witnesses who described what they had seen at Auschwitz, who described these holes, their testimony of Serb Serd. Another one was Tauber. Tauber, the eyewitness of the holes, he describes elsewhere in his testimony how the SS guards made sausages of human flesh in the crematorium, according to him. The judge said, oh yes, how interesting. And he believes it. Then there's that word Sonderkommando itself. I mean, Sonderkommando, as any German historian will tell you, is a special unit, a squad, a troop. But it's used in all the Holocaust documents as though a Sonderkommando is a man. 
which no way can it be in the German language, but every historian has sucked up that word, and the Zonderkommandos themselves, one or two are still drifting around in Israel, claiming they were Zonderkommandos, and God, how they suffered, and yes, please, me too. They say, yes, I was a Zonderkommando, but if you were a Zonderkommando, then you wouldn't call yourself a Zonderkommando, you would say, I was a member of a Zonderkommando. Yet they've all kind of drifted into this conformist stream of versions of things that happened, in their own view and in their own imagination, and they come to believe that really did happen. It's human nature, as I have said so often, to believe that these things have happened, particularly if you were there, and the people who were in Auschwitz undoubtedly did suffer. No one's saying that they had an easy time when they were there. But after the war, they have been asked about what it was like in Auschwitz. And it is not politically correct to say, well, I was in Auschwitz, but not very much happened. Here I am to tell the tale about it. No one's going to be sorry for them then or have compassion. Their aunts and uncles and nieces and nephews and descendants and grandchildren want to hear from them about the gas chambers, because that's what everyone talks about. And so they talk about the gas chambers, because they can talk about the gas chambers, because they've read about the gas chambers. They've seen movies about the gas chambers. And haven't I seen pictures of bodies being bulldozed into pits? The number of letters that I've received over the last two or three years vilifying me and saying, how can you say these things didn't happen? I've seen the movies taken by the U.S. troops of what they found. I say, hold it a minute. If they're U.S. troops, they went anywhere in the eastern zone where the so-called death camps existed. They were in Buchenwald, or they were British troops in Bergen-Belsen. If you look at the pictures of the bulldozers, it's a British soldier who's driving the bulldozer wearing British army uniform, frantically trying to dispose of these typhus plague-ridden bodies, burying them in pits before the plague gets any worse and engulfs all the occupying forces too. They're horrifying pictures, and you know how powerful the visual image can be. But I have to plead with you, as I pleaded with the court in London, when you see a visual image, that doesn't necessarily mean that what the voiceover is telling you is true. They're showing you a picture, and yet it's something totally different they're telling you about. Eberhard Jeckel, the famous German historian, Holocaust historian, professor of history at Stuttgart. He will show you, as he's shown on television in Germany in a film called Der Tod, Ein Meister aus Deutschland, Death, a master from Germany. He shows a picture, you're standing on a bridge, and underneath the bridge in front of you, going all the way down the railroad platform, is a train load of coal trucks. And these coal trucks are laden with human beings standing up, packed in, two or three hundred at a time. And the voiceover on the television series says, meanwhile, the Romanian Jews are shipped aboard trains and taken to the Auschwitz gas chambers where they're exterminated. And you've seen the picture and you think afterwards, well, it must happen, I saw the picture of it. But that picture, if you look at the original, the rubber stamp on the back, which I've got, shows it comes from the Hamburg Railway Station archives, nothing to do with Romania. It's been doctored to remove the women standing on the platform carrying shopping bags. It's been doctored to remove the train on the next platform, which has a double-decker train, which didn't exist in Romania, it only exists in Germany at that time. It's been doctored to remove a building which shows it be quite clearly Hamburg. And above all, it's been doctored to remove the caption on the back of the photograph, which shows the photograph was taken in 1946, a year after the war was over, and it shows German civilians on a shopping expedition to the Ruhr, being packed into the coal trucks for this three or four hour trip down to the Ruhr to do some shopping. Quite the opposite of the words used by the Holocaust historians. To illustrate the horror of their own story, their own legend, they had to produce again and again fake photos. The Wiesenthal Center, until recently, when we all pointed it out to them, had a photograph on their website of a smoking chimney at Auschwitz as the Hungarian civilians arrived. And there's this crematorium building at the back with the smoke belching out of the chimney. And the caption says, as these Hungarians arrive in the foreground, in the background, you can see on the photograph the chimney with the smoke pouring out of it. On the original photograph, the smoke isn't there. It's been put in by the Wiesenthal Center. And that's the way they do it. You can look at any other aspect of history. Take a look at my Nuremberg book, and you'll see I have a photograph there, not just in black and white, but in color, of the mass cremations of the bodies on the Altstadt in the marketplace in the center of Dresden after the British air raid in 1945. Every other aspect of history, you've got authentic photographs showing the events of this worst atrocity of all times involving not just one or two people, but six million allegedly, there's not one single authentic photograph that stands up to investigation by independent experts. Even that photograph we were talking about yesterday, the one with the four smudges on the roof of crematorium four, you've got to be very suspicious about that. It's been pointed out by somebody that if you look at the preceding photographs on the same roll, there's not four smudges, but six smudges. We don't know what's happened there. What we do know is that the man who published them, a man called Dino Brugioni, has subsequently published a book on photo forgery, on which he is an expert. And I put all these things to the court in London last year because I was so well funded by my internet resources and my international friends. I could never have done that myself without the assistance of many people in this room who belonged either to the advisory board that I informally put together or to the financial resource center which provided me with the means to carry on fighting. And yet what a great battle it was. What a sense of triumph to know that there I was in court with the eyes of the press of the world on this one battle. Day after day that press bench was filled with 50 or 60 journalists and I would go to court and I would hand out to these 
journalists the reports, the documents, the photostats, the pictures and the diagrams to ensure that they were properly briefed. And the enemy would do exactly the same with their own documents. But of course, they had immensely better resources. They had whole staffs working for them, two of the biggest law firms in London and the best equipped. And then the final day came of the closing speeches. And I'd been given 10 days to write the closing speech, which was very useful because I couldn't have done it in just one or two. And the closing speech that I delivered was a five hour speech to the courtroom. We had 200 journalists packed into the courtroom. And I've got to admit that the press dealt with it very fairly. They reproduced large sections from my closing speech and they reproduced it very fairly. So we did a lot of damage with that. And on the day of the judgment, April the 11th or 12th last year, of course, I knew a day ahead what the judgment was going to be. I was allowed to pick up the judgment the day beforehand. I went into the courthouse and I picked up the judgment and I went outside and held a cab and sat in the back of the cab and I opened the judgment. It was 400 pages long. And I turned straight to the last page and I could see the judgment said, I therefore find for the defendants. And I thought, well, there's no point in reading the rest of it. And I just put it aside and went home and it's going to be read out in open court the next day, of course, the judgment. So I know the next day is going to be an extremely unpleasant event. And that night there was a ring on the doorbell and it was a courier from the enemy law firm firms, bringing me a ring binder, the last of hundreds of ring binders that they had dumped on me during the trial. And this was a ring binder containing all the costs that they were going to ask the court the next day that I should pay. You've heard it said that England is the easiest place to bring a libel action. It isn't. In England, we have a rule that flattens you, and that is loser pays all. Not like the United States, where each side goes away licking its wounds. In England, the loser pays his own costs and the enemy's costs and they had run up a bill of $8 million. And here was this bill that they were sending to me so that they could justify going before the judge the next day. They knew they were going to get judgment in their favor and they were going to leap to their feet and say, now we ask for an order for costs to destroy Mr. Irving. And I opened that ring binder and I started reading and my eyes were as big as saucers. It turned out that they're neutral witnesses. Sir Richard Evans, the eminent historian from Cambridge, the totally neutral historian from Cambridge, had been paid a quarter of a million dollars to express an opinion about my books. Professor Van Pelt, a quarter million dollars to stand in that witness box and say that yes that building was undoubtedly a homicidal gas chamber and not the mortuary that it claimed to be and so on they'd all been paid colossal sums of money none of which we had known about when i had time that night it was it was a horrible night i remember because i knew that the next day was going to be one of the worst days of my life it was the penalty for the three-month humiliation that I'd inflicted on the Holocaust legend. And I spent two hours that night putting all these financial details on my website. You can see it's still there now. There's a folder there on my website containing all the payments made to the neutral witnesses by Lipstadt and her lawyers. I don't see how it can be legal. I didn't go to Canada and ask for a payment for testifying on behalf of Ernst Zundel as an expert witness. I would never have dreamed of asking for a quarter million dollars, and if I had, then I would be ashamed because I would know it would be difficult to be neutral about it. But these people, without batting an eyelash, taken that kind of money. Not a single newspaper mentioned it, except, I have to admit, The Guardian, in one column at the end of its story the next day, referred to the fact that some of the expert witnesses had received sums of money of 70 or 80 or 90,000 pounds. But nobody dared to touch this very delicate delicate matter because we can't suggest that these witnesses allowed themselves to be bribed. It would be wrong to suggest that and I want you to know that I'm not suggesting that here. But I must say that I personally would find it difficult to be neutral in a situation like that. And I am going to say that I consider that Richard Evans, Professor Evans, was anything but neutral. You will see if you read the transcripts of the trial that are on the website that I challenge him on his neutrality. On the very first day, I said it's quite obvious that the court has clearly gained the impression this morning, Professor Evans, that you dislike me. Is this true? And he said, no. And I said, but by your very posture, your manner, he stood with his hands in his pockets and his back to me half the time, that you dislike me, you dislike the books, you detest the writings, you loathe everything I stand for. It's quite obvious, isn't it? Can you confirm that? And he said, well, no, I'm completely objective about you. And at the same time, he was writing the book Telling Lies About Adolf Hitler, which is published in the United States, which is so vicious and so venomous about me at every possible level that it shows what he was really thinking, the true Richard Evans, the vicious, vindictive, lying, eternal Marxist, eternal hater, Richard Evans, this little nasty, scowling Welshman. He says in his book, Mr. Irving came into court every day dressed in a drab, disheveled, ill-fitting suit with beaten down shoes and his hair in a mess. Well, I was wearing the same suit as I'm wearing now. It's made by England's finest firm of tailors where the Duke of Edinburgh gets his suits. I had it made specifically for the trial because I know how important it is to go in there wearing, so to speak, a suit of armor that puts you one cut above everybody else in the courtroom. The shoes equally were bought in one of England's finest cobblers. So this is an example of how much he loathed me and how prepared he was to tell lies in order to present a distorted picture. Which brings us to the appeal. After the judgment was read on April the 12th last year, I 
I rose to my feet, very difficult in this packed courtroom. I wasn't wearing the jacket because I had been bombarded with eggs and missiles outside the courthouse by Professor Lipstadt's supporters while the police looked the other way. And um, the judge read out his judgment for two hours. And I then rose to my feet and I said two things. I said, well, it's quite obvious from your lordship's judgment that I have failed. I haven't failed in my complaint, but I have failed to convince your lordship, despite all my rhetoric and oratory, that I am right. And for that, I blame myself because it's quite obvious that I am right, but I have failed to convince your lordship. What I meant was you're so dense, you haven't seen the points I'm trying to make, or you're so craven that you don't admit that I'm right. Both of which points, I have to say, I sympathize with him, and he was in a horrible position as a first-time judge. I then said, as the opposing lawyers leapt to their feet and asked for their six million pounds costs, I then said, well, obviously there has to be a hearing on this because we have certain points to make. It quite obviously it's wrong that they should have spent this huge sum of money on the defense. There are legal rules which prevent them, what are called proportionality, and the judge agreed that there should be a hearing one month down the road. So they didn't get their pound of flesh, if I can put it indelicately like that. And I then said, I want leave to appeal. And the judge said, I'm not going to give you leave to appeal. That may sound unfair, but in fact, under the normal rules of English justice now, it's incumbent on a judge not to grant leave to appeal automatically. He really has to satisfy himself there may be grants and then he may give you leave to appeal. So we had to go to the Court of Appeal to ask for permission to appeal. It may sound a bit complicated, but that's what we had to do and that's what we did. When we went to the Court of Appeal, they said we will consider this at a lengthy hearing, but we will consider the two matters in sequence with no interruption. We'll hear your application for permission followed subsequently by the appeal and you must put all the material that you're going to use in the appeal in your application. So we had to do the whole work for the appeal just making the application, which made it immensely complicated and costly for us. At the end of the day, they refused us permission to appeal. So the appeal was never heard. And this is bad news and good news for various complicated legal reasons, which I'm not going to go into here because I don't want my enemies in this action to get us for any action to know what's going on. And this particular videotape, which we're making today, will be shown in Australia. And through all these internet, international connections that my enemies have, undoubtedly it will come back with the speed of light to my opponents in London. Suffice it to say that the appeal itself was fought in a dismal fashion. And I'm going to be arrogant enough to say that this is because I didn't fight it myself. As you know, I fought the hearing in the lower court by myself. And people say he who has taken to representing himself in a court of law has a fool for a client. Not so. The judge himself, Judge Gray, the odious Sir Charles Gray, who represented war criminals and others in the past, himself said in an interview with The Guardian, when questioned on that very point, do you think Irving was right to act on his own behalf in the lower court? His response was to the effect that nobody could have done it better for the simple reason that I had the complete control of the historical facts at my fingertips. And those of you who've been involved in litigation will know there's nothing more infuriating than sitting behind your lawyer while your lawyer makes a mess of it, because he hasn't got control of the facts. He doesn't know what happened. He's interested only in his fee and how many billable hours he can put into you. It's a cruel fact of law that the lawyer isn't going to know one twentieth of what you know about the case. And you need to know the whole case in order to be able to leap instantly on any misstatements and say, ha ha, but what about that? And your lawyer can't do that. So you're faced with the alternative in a court of law of having a lawyer who's a bad historian or a historian who is an indifferent lawyer. And I went for the alternative course and I learned enough of the law to see me through the primary court. I could have done it in the court of appeal. There's nothing technically or constitutionally to say you can't go alone into the court of appeal. But I'm not so arrogant as to think that I could have persuaded three appeal court judges. So I hired a firm of lawyers called Goldsmiths with the obvious disadvantage advantage, which will occur to you just from the name. But they've been recommended to me by Count Tolstoy, and I have to say, I have no objection whatsoever to employing Jewish lawyers. Sometimes it makes a lot of sense to employ them in an action like this. And they had been recommended to me by Count Tolstoy. Count Tolstoy was the opponent of Lord Aldington. He was the opponent of Sir Charles Gray's client in the previous action years ago over the murder of the Cossacks and the Yugoslavs. And Count Tolstoy said, I can recommend no better firm than the one I am presently employing, Goldsmiths. They're fully up to date on defamation law and they are very good in the Court of Appeal. And for one week they acted for me, very willingly, until one of their partners objected for religious reasons to representing me. And of course I made a lot of noise about that in the press. I said such things as they wonder where anti-Semitism comes from. They act against me in that way because they are Jews. If I was to act against them in that way because they were Jews, it would be anti-Semitism. I wasn't quite as forceful as that. 
But that, of course, is the underlying reason for disrespecting a lawyer who refuses to take a case for religious reasons. I've frequently said when people say, what do you think about the Jewish control of the media and the mafia and the, the, the Hollywood and so on? I say, I have no objection to that whatsoever. If the Jews make the better films, if Steven Spielberg turns our first class movies, I've got no objection. I like good movies like anybody else. But if they use their position to disadvantage non-Jews, that's a different matter. And here was a clear example of a Jewish law partner using his position to disadvantage a non-Jew because he was Jewish. Never mind. We separated on amicable terms, which wasn't easy for them because, of course, I could have gone to the Court of Appeal and said, I insist that they remain on the record. They come on the record and they can't come off the record without the consent of the court and without my consent. But I was magnanimous and generous and let them go, and I took on a new lawyer called Nigel Adams. Nigel Adams had been recommended to me, and he turned out to be the most ineffectual and incompetent man I have ever met. He could only type with one finger. He knew nothing about emails. He couldn't operate a photocopy machine. He had never seen a fax machine. He did nothing of what should have been done in the course of the appeal. I know I've come under severe criticism for not introducing in the course of the appeal the Germar Rudolph report that we commissioned especially to defeat the Van Pelt report used in the lower court. Well, there were reasons why I hadn't used him, but now in the court of appeal we thought it was important to bring it in because suddenly the chemistry of the case had become important. We have difficulties in English law in the Court of Appeal in introducing new evidence. And any lawyers here will know what those difficulties are, but in England the problem is that in the Court of Appeal the new evidence has to satisfy the test known as Ladd and Marshall, which is a precedent which says effectively, unless you've got bloody good reasons for not having introduced that document in the lower court, then we're not going to let you introduce it in the appeal, which is reasonable because otherwise litigation could go on endlessly. The Germar Rudolph document would have caused us problems there because there weren't really good reasons why I hadn't called Germa Rudolph in the first hearing. I thought I had good reasons, but probably the Court of Appeal would have disagreed. More serious was the fact that I wanted to show that their expert witnesses were biased. They'd been overpaid, they'd been effectively bribed to say rotten things about me. They were no longer objective and neutral, as they should be, as between the parties. Quite clearly, English law says that expert witnesses have to be neutral as between the parties. And here we didn't have the Ladd and Marshall problem because the evidence we wanted to introduce had only arisen since the lower court hearing. The Ladd and Marshall rule didn't apply. Professor Evans, the expert witness, had made the mistake of giving evidence in a tribunal hearing in New Zealand against one of our friends, a non-conformist historian named Joel Stuart Haywood. Joel Stuart Hayward had written incorrect things about the Holocaust in a PhD thesis. He'd written good things about the revisionist movement in his PhD thesis. And this had come to light after 10 years, and the traditional enemies had discovered that this man, who was by now head of the Institute of Strategic Studies in the University of Auckland in New Zealand, had this passed. And they demanded that he should be dismissed, that his doctorate should be revoked, all the usual things, which to us seem unthinkable in this country. But in New Zealand, it didn't seem unthinkable. And they piled colossal pressure on the university to apologize to the Jewish community for having given this man a doctorate so incautiously, for having appointed him head of the Institute of Strategic Studies and all the rest. And he fought back, and he hired lawyers to defend himself. And the other side sent for Professor Evans, who had distinguished himself so nobly on behalf of Professor Lipstadt in the London action against that Holocaust denier, David Irving. She was the dragon slayer, and he was the sword bearer of the dragon slayer. So Professor Evans was called upon to write a report on Haywood and his writings. And this time he came a cropper, because the experts of the tribunal, in their final they said it is quite obvious that Professor Richard Evans is not objective. He has displayed a degree of polemics in his report, which are so far from neutrality as to be unacceptable. He doesn't appreciate the need for an expert witness to be completely neutral as between the parties and to use language entirely devoid of polemics. All the criticisms that we had made of him were suddenly there, written by New Zealand judges. And the New Zealand legal system has very high standing in England, unlike the Australian legal system, which is not held in high merit. The New Zealand judges are considered to be of great worth and weight. So that was one document we wanted to introduce. We had the actual printed report of the New Zealand tribunal with its condemnation of Evans and his methods. And the other document we wanted to introduce, of course, was the Evans book, where he says on one page, we were all of the opinion, the expert witnesses and the lawyers for Lipstadt and so on, that David Irving defiled every room he was in by his very presence. This is the man who says on oath, oh no, I have no dislike of you, Mr. Irving. I'm completely objective about you, Mr. Irving, on oath, and that is perjury. And in England, you go to prison for perjury, as Geoffrey Archer now knows, as Jonathan Aitken now knows, who was another client of Sir Charles Gray. He went to prison for perjury. So perjury is a serious matter, and I wanted to have that book put before the Court of Appeal as evidence for the fact that these expert witnesses were not neutral at all, and her whole case rested on them. And we fell flat on our faces, because on the second day of the Court of Appeal, it turned out that Nigel Adams, this bumbling lawyer that I had hired and paid a fortune to already, had not made the necessary application in time.
He hadn't applied for permission to put in the Germar Rudolph report. He hadn't applied in time to put in the Evans book as evidence before the court. He hadn't applied for permission to put in the New Zealand report. And in the Court of Appeal, you could detect a silent smirk on their faces, said, we're not going to hear it. They withdrew, they debated it for 10 minutes, and they came back. You could see that one of them had wanted to, but the other two judges said flatly, no, we're not going to accept this. And that's the rules of the court. And if you haven't played the game by the rules, then frankly, ladies and gentlemen, you're out. So by day three, it was quite plain we were going down. In fact, my own barrister said, he turned around at one point and I said, how are we doing? He said, we're going down, we're going down badly. So by day four, it was obvious we'd lost. And this was the rub. It was a loss, not of an appeal, but it was a loss of an application for permission to appeal. You may say, well, what's the difference? Well, the difference is that this was a procedural matter that we'd lost on. And under English law, there is no appeal from a procedural decision. You can't go to the next higher court, the House of Lords. End of case. This was the reason why they had evolved this little bit of legal trickery at the beginning of the hearing, that they were not going to hear the appeal, they were only going to hear the application for permission to appeal, and simultaneously wanted all the evidence to be put in. So that's the end of the Lipstadt matter. We grit our teeth, we sit down and we wait, and something rather odd begins to happen. The Jewish community begin looking around and saying, well, Irving is finished, hooray. And the journalists come and interview me and they say, totally destroyed, wiped out, financially ruined, isn't that correct? And my investors and people who have backed my publishing product begin to get quite nervous, quite wrongly, because all that is firewalled away in a different operation. And I say to the journalists, think, who has won? They say, well, what are you saying, who has won? You've lost. The Court of Appeal said you've lost. And I said, I am still writing. I still have my fountain pen. I still have the paper. I still have the publishing imprint, which I set up myself 10 years ago as a lifeboat, because I knew this was going to happen. So I'm still standing. My opponents in this action have lost already $8 million, which they will not recover. Does that tell you who's won? And they said, um, well, let's stand back and wait. We have waited now for two months, and it hasn't happened. There are legal reasons why I apprehend that nothing will happen. So we know what a Pyrrhic victory is. We can ask ourselves, standing back and reviewing this in the light of history, who won this battle and who is going to win the next? because exactly the same procedure will happen. It seems ugly because I have no intention of destroying free speech, but suddenly the press and the media have begun to take me seriously. Open season has ended. Their licenses have been withdrawn. They can no longer pour the slime on me that they used to in the old days. Professor Evans, his book, Lying About Hitler, is available in Barnes & Noble down the street. But if you go to England, there's not a single bookstore shot in that book. His own publisher, William Heinemann Limited, a Jewish firm, who published Martin Gilbert's works as well, told the infuriated Professor Richard Evans, we are not going to publish the book you've submitted. He said, but you said it's a wonderful book. And they said, yes, but it is also libelous, which means defamatory about Mr. Irving and untrue. And we are not going to face the kind of financial risks that Penguin Books Limited faced on behalf of Deborah Lipstadt. And I'm very sorry for Penguin Books because they could have got out of this very early on, three years ago, before the action came to the courts. I said, if you pay 500 pounds to a charity for the limbless in memory of my oldest daughter, then I will end the action against you and you'll be home and free. Instead of which they went ahead and fought the action and ran up a bill for $8 million. And if I was one of their shareholders, I think I would be pretty mad about that. So I'm still standing and I'm still fighting and I'm going to continue to fight. But to do that, I need to maintain the two resources. The first resource is the internet. And I ask any of you who have internet connections both to connect with me and to stand by when the next trial begins, and also the financial resources, the ability to carry on the fight. And it's a winning battle because now we have brought the matter before the worldwide international reading community. No longer do they accept the legends. Gitta Sereni, whom I'm suing, I read out from her article in the Times, which was published three or four days ago, says quite clearly to the interviewer at the Times, Auschwitz was not a death camp, and I wish people would not describe it as such. And she's the expert on Treblinka, so she knows what she's saying. And she also goes on to say, and historians should stop writing rubbish or untruths because that only plays into the hands of people like David Irving who show them up. <laughs> now, how about that? Thank you very much.